Shellcode is compact, executable code that is an extremely common component of modern malware execution. But because it's self-contained with very little structure or dependencies, it can be challenging to analyze by simply reading the code. In this video series, I'll share practical techniques I use to quickly extract and analyze malicious code. Starting in this first video with the initial step, extracting shellcode from multi-stage malware. So I have a sample here on my desktop called syswow.exe, which is a 64-bit Windows executable. And I'll show you two approaches I've used to extract shellcode from malware like this. The first approach is a bit manual, while the second is more automated. For the first approach, I'll toss this sample into X64 Debug, which is my preferred debugger. Here on the desktop, I have X64 Debug right here. So I'll go ahead and drag and drop syswow.exe into X64 Debug. And once it loads, I'll go ahead and do just a little bit of window resizing since we don't need to look at the op codes right now. Uh, but there are other areas of this screen that we'll definitely want to keep an eye on as this demo progresses. Now, when analyzing multi-stage malware, it's important to understand that each additional stage of execution, like shellcode, often requires its own space in memory to execute successfully. Memory can be allocated using a variety of approaches, but a popular Windows API used for this purpose is virtual alloc. In addition to virtual alloc, I also pay close attention to virtual protect, which is used to update the permissions of a region in memory. Typically, malware uses virtual alloc to create new memory with initial permissions, and then virtual protect to make it executable, allowing it to, for example, store and run shellcode. But some malware skips that allocation step and just uses virtual protect to change permissions and overwrite existing content with executable code. That's why I set breakpoints on both virtual alloc and virtual protect. And by the way, if you have any questions about what you're seeing or anything specific you'd like me to clarify, feel free to leave a comment below and I'll do my best to help you out. So back here in my debugger, I'm gonna set breakpoints on both virtual alloc and virtual protect. And I'm gonna do that down here in the command window by typing BP virtual alloc semicolon BP virtual protect. The single command will allow me to set breakpoints on both of those APIs. And then I'll go ahead and press enter. And I can confirm those breakpoints are in place by going to the breakpoints tab here. And we do in fact see breakpoints for both virtual alloc and virtual protect. Next, I'm gonna run the program to check if and when these APIs are called. To do this, I can go to the debug menu here at the top and choose run. I can also hit the F9 shortcut on my keyboard. So let me go ahead and just choose run at this time. After running the program, you can see that I've now arrived at virtual alloc within kernel32.dll. You can see kernel32.dll specified here at the top in the menu bar. Let's take a quick look at the fourth argument passed to virtual alloc. Now that's gonna be passed via R9, which we can see down here on the right-hand side. This argument sets the permissions for the allocated region. And in this case, it's four, which if you looked up this value on Microsoft.com, you would find it means page read write. So right now, anything placed here won't be executable, at least not yet. I'll come back to this point in a minute. What I'm really interested in right now is the return value of virtual alloc, which tells us the starting address of the memory that was just allocated. To get that, I can go to debug once more here at the top and choose execute till return. Now, once we are at the end of the function, if we check RAX here on the top right, this is going to store the base address of that allocated region. To keep an eye on that address, I'll first go ahead and right click on this value and then choose follow in dump. And this will bring it down to my dump window here on the bottom left. I'll then begin executing individual instructions to see if any of them make changes to this recently allocated memory. To execute instructions, I can go back here to the debug menu and choose step over, or I can hit F8. If I go ahead and do that from this return instruction where I currently reside, you'll see that it takes me back to syswow.exe, right? You'll notice no reference to kernel32.dll anymore. And if I even just scroll up one instruction, you'll see that I have now returned from a recent call to virtual alloc, which is precisely where we set that breakpoint. As I continue executing instructions by hitting F8 on my keyboard, you'll see that I've now entered a loop and you can see the visual cue, this red arrow here on the left-hand side, indicating that I've now hit the first instruction within a loop. Observing a loop right after memory is allocated is a 
really good indication that some deobfuscation will occur because a loop performs an action over and over again, and that's generally what happens when some content is decoded. You'll also observe an XOR instruction right here, which is common in both simple and even more complex algorithms. And here you'll see a move instruction that is placing one byte into another location in memory. This is another strong indication that we're looking at some deobfuscation. Now, watch what happens in the dump window at the bottom as I continue to press F8 on my keyboard to execute individual instructions through multiple iterations of this loop. You'll see that with each iteration of the loop, another byte appears here at the bottom. Now, if we want to speed up this process a bit, we can click on the instruction immediately after the loop ends, which will be here, and then go to debug, run until selection. Now we have a lot more content. And in this case, just by scanning the ASCII down here, you can start to see references to strings like win init. If I go lower here, you'll see what appears to be a user agent string. And if I continue scrolling down, you'll even see what looks like an IP address. Just a quick note, if you're getting value from this video, let me know by hitting that like button, which also helps this video reach other people who might find it useful too. But returning to the code, with some experience, you'll come to recognize this FC opcode as one that commonly appears at the beginning of shellcode. It translates to the CLD or clear direction flag instruction. This instruction often appears at the beginning of shellcode to ensure that any string operations process bytes in the expected manner, basically from lower to higher memory addresses. Now, even if you don't have that opcode memorized, you could also click here in the dump window and choose follow in disassembler. And with a bit of prior exposure to code analysis, you could start to recognize that this content does look like actual instructions you would see in a program. One other point I wanna make, you can see that by scrolling down here in the dump window, after not much time, I reach a bunch of zeros, right? So that observation combined with the user agent string, uh, win inet, and what appears to be an IP address might suggest that this shellcode is responsible for downloading another stage of execution. In contrast, if I find myself scrolling for several minutes through the region and memory allocated for shellcode, it often means that there is some additional content, some additional substance there, such as an embedded executable. So we're looking at a simpler case here, which is great if you're just getting started with shellcode analysis. Now, if I continue running this program, and in this case, I'm gonna just hit this arrow here, which when I mouse over says run, you'll see that I eventually encounter the virtual protect API. The first argument, which is passed via RCX, we see that referenced right here. You'll notice the contents of RCX, which is 420000, actually match the starting address of the region where this content might be that we think is shellcode. Another argument worth noting is the third argument, which is gonna be stored here in R8. You'll see the value here is two zero. This specifies the memory protection constant. In other words, the memory permissions that are being applied to this region in memory. And if you, you were to look up hex 20 on microsoft.com, you'll see that it equates to page execute read, the keyword being execute. This is a big clue that we're likely dealing with a shell code that is ready to actually be run. Now that we've deobfuscated the code, let's go ahead and isolate it for additional inspection by actually dumping it down to disk. To do that, I'm gonna go here in the dump window once more. I'm gonna right click and choose follow in memory map. Here in the memory map, I'll focus on the row that is highlighted in gray, which is right here. I'm then going to right click and choose dump memory to file. I'm gonna make sure I dump this to the desktop and I'm just gonna update the file name to make it a bit simpler by removing all of these leading zeros. And then I'll go ahead and hit save. To confirm that the file has been dumped properly, I'll briefly load it into Binary Ninja's free version, which I have here on my desktop. So here is the shellcode file that I dumped. I'm now gonna drag and drop this into Binary Ninja free. I'll go ahead and click start. And now I need to make sure that I choose the correct platform, which is specified right here. So right now, by default, it shows x86. I know this is an x8664 file, and it is for Windows. So let me go ahead and choose Windows x8664, and then hit open. I'll go ahead and maximize this window right here. You'll see, originally, it brings me to the triage view, but I'm going to go ahead and choose linear to actually begin taking a look at the code. By the way, if you haven't used Binary Ninja before and you want a quick overview of this free version, check out one of my earlier videos that I'll link to in the description. Now, I won't go into a full analysis here, but you can see that by default, Binary Ninja brings me to the high-level IL view, 
And as I briefly look at some of this code, you can see that it nicely identifies the process environment block, which is often used by malware to resolve APIs. If I go ahead and transition now from the high-level IL to the disassembly, which is the other view available in the free version, we can see that we do in fact have the CLD instruction, which we saw when we looked at it in the dump window that equates here to the FC opcode on the left-hand side. We can also see that it's followed by a call. If I go ahead and jump to the target of this call instruction, you'll see that it takes me to a function that again has additional calls as well. Now, one interesting thing here is you can see that in both cases of these calls, RDX is populated with a hexadecimal value uh, immediately before the call. I'm gonna leave it at this for now, but if you've made it this far, drop a comment with what you think these hexadecimal values might represent. Some quick online research could give you a hint. All right, well, that wraps up our first approach to extracting shellcode from multi-stage malware. Today, we set breakpoints in a debugger to catch the deobfuscation process, confirm we're dealing with shellcode, and then finally save it for further analysis. In the next video, we'll explore a more automated method to extract this same shellcode. So if you wanna find out when that next video drops, make sure to hit subscribe. I'll see you next time.